Welcome to week three of classic Christmas. So I don't know how Christmas goes in your house, but Christmas in my house growing up as a child went something like this. Mom would, would purchase the presents, mom would wrap the presents, there'd be some secret code to the way the presents were wrapped because mom quickly figured out as uh, the three boys that she was raising grew older, they, they would really run to the tree to see and identify whose presents were whose. So they were, they were wrapped in different paper. They were uh, put, had ribbons with different uh, colors or, or schemes on them to help her know whose presents were what. And then on Christmas, dad would be the deliverer of the gifts. I don't know how it worked in your house, but, but there's probably someone who was uh, the gift passer outer person, right? Uh, they got to go into the tree and, and they got to, to take the ki- gifts and, and, and then the magic happened, at least in my heart as a child. It's when dad would look at the gift and, and he would see the, the name on it or, or identify the way in which mom wrapped it and said, to Tim. Oh, how those words were amazing. <laughs> like when you heard the word to and, and you just waited with anticipation and it was your name, like your, your heart raced and your, your, your brain was going in, 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 in circles and, and you had a little drool coming out of your mouth just hoping that it was the amazing gift that you had all your dreams set upon getting, right? And you had to do everything in your power uh, just to, to wait to hear who it was from. <laughs> Is this from mom or dad? Because that might be a different gift than the one from aunt and uncle, right? It, it might have different meaning, different value, and, and, and different importance. So, so you had to do everything in your power just to identify not only who it was to, but, but who it was from. Now, the only thing better than hearing my name called was hearing my brother's names not called. <laughs> as often as mine. And what I didn't realize back in the day when I was a child, but I do now as an adult, uh, not to give it away, kids, but but parents, they work really hard at making it fair. Like when I was a kid and we were younger, we all opened the same number of gifts because mom and dad knew we counted. And sometimes that meant if I got a more expensive gift, uh, my mom would break down the four pack of socks and in each box there was one pair of socks. (laughs) And I'm like, this is awesome, I got all these socks. Sorry, socks. Nowadays are kind of cool to get, I think, actually. Uh, The only thing that has changed is the number of gifts that have my name on it in today's world. As an adult, I get less gifts. My mom and dad don't give the same volume. In our family, when when we get together with my wife's side of the family, uh, the adults sometimes exchange names or set a limit to a a price tag, and you you play the elephant uh, game, uh, elephant gift game, random style. You pick, you exchange, you you hopefully get one that you want kind of thing. But there's usually at least one or two or maybe three gifts that have your name on it. And even as a 46-year-old, my heart still gets excited for gifts. I'm not going to lie. Now, there's some of you who are saying, I'm not so sure about that. So I have a little game for you. As you entered into church today, you received a bulletin. Now, those of you who don't take bulletins, you're automatically disqualified. No going to the ushers now. But some of you came in today, and you had a bulletin that had a special red sticker on the back, this back side of the bulletin that that you've never looked at before, and now I want you to look at it. And and, and there are a few of them roaming around the church this morning, so if you have a bulletin, take it out. And if you've got a red sticker, put your hand up in the air, because I have a gift that has your name on it from me. I got one in the back. All right. Someone's, there's more in here. I trust me. Hands up high. All right. Merry Christmas. There you go. Where are my other hands? Right here in the middle. Merry Christmas. Yeah, I better look. Somebody might lie. I mean, it's church and everything. <laughs> Hannah Beret, Merry Christmas. Where's my other ones? Over on this side. Ooh, everyone's stockpiled over on this side. Merry Christmas, and I'm not sure what the last one is, but there we go. Now, for the rest of you who didn't get a gift, this isn't very classic, is it? It's not the way it's supposed to work. (laughs) Because in my house, everyone had at least how many presents under the tree? At least one, right? Even mom and dad get one, and grandpa and grandma get one. Even the the kids get a lot. And I apologize to you. But here's the thing I have for you. I have a gift that's far greater than the ones they got. And it has your name on it. And that's what I want you to see in this classic Christmas section from Luke chapter 2. I want you to see that a great deal of thought went into this gift. I want you to see the the effort and and everything that's behind it and and, and what the gift is. 
And just like your heart races when you begin to open the gift, hoping that it's the greatest, the biggest, the, the thing at the top of your list kind of gift, I want you from this day and through, through Christmas this year to be filled with that kind of excitement for what we're going to celebrate on December 24th and 25th. And, and I think God wants you to have a classic Christmas filled with more joy about this gift than any gift that can be under the tree, under any Xbox that you could get, under uh, greater than any Lexus that could be in the driveway, greater than anything you might ever receive kind of gift. And these two verses basically tell you and me and the whole world from God's perspective that you are loved. And it gives you the reason why this Christmas you can have joy, even if your name is not written on a great number of presents. Here's our verses from, from Luke chapter 2 for today that we're going to unpack. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, before we unpack that just a little bit, I, I want you to remember what transpired right before this. Last week, Pastor Mike or Pastor Michael, depending on which campus or which service you were at, unpacked Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The story of the shepherds, uh, the black sheep, the, the, the people who first heard about what transpired in Bethlehem in a stable and was laid in a manger. And the, the angels appeared to them, these bottom rung of society, these outcasts, these scoundrels, these, these guys who were working to, to just pay the bills out in the fields, who, who were no names, and, and declared a message to them. But remember how the, the shepherds felt at first. They were terrified. They feared a fear that was a great one. <laughs> So, so they were shaking in their boots. They uh, were, were, were terrified because they thought their life might be coming to an end. But the angel said this, and it's where we left off. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Good news, great joy for all people. And we pushed pause a after that last week, all right? This is the verse that tells us what the good news of great joy is. So if you want more joy in your Christmas, if you want a heart that is filled with joy, then these are the words that are life-changing, powerful words. And the angel basically declares to those shepherds some, some insider knowledge, some truths that he longs for all people to know that they were the first to hear. Now, if we go through this verse, I want you to see some things about this amazing gift, about the thing that, that transpired 2,000 years ago that makes Christmas classic. Uh, so we're going to fill in some of the blanks so you can identify this. Maybe you've never done this before with Luke chapter 2 and these verses because you said them so many times, you heard them at Christmas, they kind of rolled off your tongue, yeah, today in the town of David a Savior's been born, blah, blah, blah. It's not a blah, 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 all right? And here's why. Today, the first words out of the angel to the shepherds is this, today. And I know some of you are going, but that's not that exciting that's not like, like this life-changing, altering word. Because you know what happened this morning? Today. You got up, and you know what you had? Coffee. Today. And if you didn't get it before you came to church, you could get it because Luann came here today. And she made it. And later today, you're going to go home and have lunch. And today, you're going to watch another Packer game. And, and today, you're going to maybe take a nap. Well, at least I'm going to take a nap. And maybe today... You're going to wrap some presents. It's just another day. But the angels wanted the shepherds to know that wasn't the case. Today, the angel said. And here's why that matters and is significant about what is about to transpire in their lives and why it's life-changing for you and me. In your lifetime, you might, if you are lucky and you're the average, experience about 77 rough years. That means you're going to get 28,000 todays. And you might go, wow, that's kind of cool, 28,000? That sounds like a lot. Do you know what the angel was telling those shepherds when he said today? He was telling them this. That promise first made to Adam and Eve on that day they ate from a tree. The promise repeated to people like King David on a day when he had sinned and rebelled. The, the, the promise repeated by Isaiah to people who were rebelling against God and were going to be taken off to captivity in a few days. That day, today, the angel said, was a day like no other. In fact, if you do the math and, and you believe in the Bible and what it says, uh, as God would have us believe, and by faith uh, believe in creation and six days of creation, that the lowest number probably that people would say have, have come and gone since creation to, to this day was 1.46 million. 
I times 4,000 by 365, and that's what you get. 1.46 million todays had come and gone with people hoping and wondering, will today be the day? So what transpired on that day is greater than your birthday, which is one every 365, and it's greater than your wedding day, which is one in, in, in 28K for, for you who've been married all your for many years of your life. It's greater than the day on which your children were born, as great as it was, because this day, what transpired was life-changing for all people for eternity kind of days. Uh, the arrival of a baby that had been anticipated not for nine months, but for 1.46 million days. And the angel went on. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Not only is this a day like no other day, a one in a million kind of days, I I'm going to let you know that what has transpired and what is taking place is fulfilling every last promise that God has made these shepherds, while they might have been scoundrels, while they might have been the outcasts of society, while they might have looked, been looked down upon, they knew the Old Testament most likely. They were Jewish Christians. They, they had heard the promises, the predictions, the prophecies. And, and when the angel sends up the, the signal, hey, this is what's transpiring. You're out here in the fields nearby Bethlehem. It, it, you're you're going to find in the city of David, the fulfiller of every promise, the, the lineage mattered. So what's transpiring today is one in a million, and, and what's happening is, is taking place in the place it was supposed to happen. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. In other words, the, the angel didn't want the shepherds to miss it. In the early service today, I had this great plan with the stickers on the back of the bulletins. You know what the ushers did? They all took a, a stack of them, and they wandered around, and, and some of them didn't get passed out. <laughs> You know why? Because I didn't tell them that pass these out first. <laughs> I didn't give them the sign. I didn't give them the signal. The, the angels didn't want the shepherds to miss what had happened. <laughs> the, the angel wanted the shepherds to, to know very clearly how to find this baby. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. I don't know how many babies would have been born in Bethlehem. That time it was a small city, and, and I'm guessing it wouldn't have been too hard, but, but most people who would have had a baby would have had it in their homes. It would have been outward and, and open for everyone to see, but, but God wanted the shepherds to know, you'll be able to find it, and here's how you're going to find it. You're going to go to a stable, you're going to find a manger, and there in a manger is going to be a baby wrapped in cloths. The shepherds would have said, that does not make sense, because we as experts in the field of taking care of animals know that a stable and a manger's only purpose is for animals. They were experts on it. So, so God clued them in, and they were easily going to find what had happened. All those things, as amazing as they are, a one in a million kind of day, uh, the signs and the signals and the evidence to, to find it and, and, and the link to the, the prophecies pale in comparison to the rest of the message that I left out the first time we worked through it. Well, let's go back to verse 11, because here's what I want you to see about this gift. And those five of you who got an envelope this morning, some of you maybe already ripped it open because your heart's like mine and you can't resist the temptation to find out what the gift is, right? And some of you are waiting because you just don't want to look like that person because people around you are looking to see. <laughs> and others, others of you are really proud of the gift and you want everyone to see what you got and they didn't. Well, God wants you to know what you got and what the shepherds got and the gift that's for everybody. And here it is. Today in the town of David, a, a savior has been born to you. Here's what the word savior means, literally. One who delivers from danger. And this is the amazing thing about the message that was being spoken by angels to shepherds who were in a role that was to deliver people from, or sheep from danger, right? The message is, today in the town of David, here's what you're going to find. Here, here's the gift that is yours. Here, here, here is what is taking place. A savior has been born. One who will deliver you from danger. See, the shepherd's role was to, to deliver his sheep from danger. Sheep are known to stray. They, they get confused. Uh, they easily wander off. And, and a shepherd's role is to, to be there to keep them from danger, from the danger of walking off the side of a cliff kind of danger, from the danger that is a wolf or a thief who longs to steal or attack and destroy kind of danger. And, and what God was cluing the, the shepherds into is what's transpiring today in the town of David is what you and I need as well. Someone who will deliver us from danger. 
as someone who can rescue us from, from temptation, one who can deliver us from falling off the cliff, one who can do what we can't do to, to, to overcome the times that we have wandered and strayed and, and fall in danger. Today in the town of David, a, a savior has been born to you, one who will deliver you from danger. And he's the Christ, the Messiah. And titles that were used to, to describe in the Old Testament, New Testament, the chosen one. So this Savior, the one who's going to deliver you, is the promised one, the, the chosen one, the, the one that was first predicted to Adam and Eve. He, he's the one who, who, who God said would, would come and be called Emmanuel. He is the one who would be born in, in Bethlehem. He, he's the chosen one who can do what you can't do, what I can't do, what, what no human being could ever do. Pay the price that you and I couldn't pay. He, he's the Savior the, the deliverer from danger. He's the Messiah, the chosen one, first promised to Adam and Eve. And he's the Lord. See, because here's the thing God wanted the shepherds not to miss. Not just that they, he didn't want them to miss that there would be a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Because no offense, I, I've been to hospitals and I've, I've seen babies and they've been wrapped in cloths. And my guess is Jesus didn't look that much different. My guess is he maybe cried a little bit because it was cold out in that stable. Now, my guess is when the shepherds got there, that maybe their heart would have been prone to believe or think that, well, this child isn't anything different. It looks just like every other child. There, there's no halo. Uh, there's no royal throne. There's, there's no bag of money that could be possible for the Messiah because the Jewish culture had kind of bought into this belief that, that the Messiah would be a, a king and he'd maybe born to the royal family, uh, maybe born to someone special and, and rich. And God didn't want the shepherds to miss it. He doesn't want you and I to miss it. Because while Jesus was a baby, true man, he was also the Lord. And this title, the Lord, is the title preferred for rulers and kings. Uh, and literally, this is what the word Lord means. One who gets the last word in. And God wanted those shepherds to understand that not only is this baby like every other baby, that he might carry a few genetic traits of his mother, uh, that, that were passed on to him from a DNA strand. But he's God. He's the king of heaven. He's the Lord. And he's going to get the last word in. And, and here's the last word that this baby was going to get in. in. In fact, I want you to take you back to the, some of the first words that the first sinners heard. How is Jesus going to get the last word in? Why does it matter? Do you remember what, what God said to Adam and Eve in the face of their sin? After he said to Eve, your pain is going to be in childbirth. After he said to Adam, uh, you, you are going to return to the dust of the ground. You're going to die. In the middle of all that, God said to, to Eve, he said this, I'm going to send someone who's going to crush the serpent's head. I'm going to send someone who's going to get the last word in on sin and, and who's going to conquer death and who's going to defeat the devil. Uh, he's going to get the last word, and this is not just a baby. This is God himself, the one who can do what you can't do, who can live a perfect life, and who can pay the price that you can't pay kind of last word in. And you know why this matters for you and me? Because if Jesus didn't get the last word, and if Jesus wasn't true God, then, then you and I are doomed for eternity. Because everything would depend on us. <laughs> So God wants, wants you to know, as you get ready for Christmas, why, why that first Christmas was classic and what can make your Christmas classic. It's that the person that was born in Bethlehem is the one who delivers from danger, the one who delivers from sin, the, the promised one, the one God predicted, and he's the Lord. And he got the last word in on your sin and mine. And he defeated death for you and for me and for your loved ones who have already died. And, and he's going to get the last word in on eternity and make it yours and mine with him. See, what God was telling the shepherds was, was life-changing truth about this baby that was born, but there's even more. And here's the game changer for your Christmas, I pray, that will leave you today and this Christmas with joy, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what loss you face, no matter what you're going through kind of joy. Today, in the town of David, if we go to our next slide, we'll fill in one more blank, a Savior has been born to you. Like, you know what I love about Christmas? 
When I get together with my parents still, uh, maybe a day or two after Christmas, we try and do that in Milwaukee where my brother lives. My mom still brings me gifts, and they're different. <laughs> uh, some of them are the classic regular gifts that she gives every year, but every once in a while she, she pulls out the bag and she goes, I got an extra one for you and for Andy. That's my younger brother. I'm like, sweet, <laughs> like me. And you know why I love usually hearing there's an extra gift for me and Andy? It's usually an Ohio State item because my mom knows what speaks to my heart. And that has my name written all over it. She put time and she put thought and she put effort into it just for me. And you know why my mom does that, even though I'm 46 years old? Because she loves me. And she wants me to know it. So she writes her name on it from mom and dad to Tim. And that's what God wanted those shepherds to know. What you're about to find in that, 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 that manger who's the Savior, who's the, the Messiah, who's the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, who's going to deliver you, that gift, that child is for you. And here's what God wants you to know. It's also for you. God has on that gift your name to you. To you, to Brian, and to Matt, to Caleb, to Adam, to Donna, to Dave, and to Paul, to you. That's what transpired. It, that day, that one in a point four six million kind of days. In fact, if you want to do the math, in 2,000 years have passed since Jesus coming, it's now 2.1 million days kind of day, life-changing for you. And that's what makes this passage from John chapter 3 the most memorized, known passage of, of all time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. See, you and I live in the world. Adam and Eve were residents and citizens of the world. King David, a sinner, was someone who lived in the world. Isaiah and John the Baptist and Martin Luther and every last person since Jesus has lived in the world. And, and that goes for you and for me. And God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave a gift to you. So I know what's going to happen over the next seven and eight days. Gifts are going to be wrapped. <laughs> Excitement's going to build. Trees are going to be filled around with, with presents that, are, that, that start to entice the mind to, to think about what's in them. And in your home and in my home, when, when Christmases are celebrated, your name's going to be read and your heart's going to flutter and you're going to get excited and you're going to start ripping open wrapping paper. What I don't want you to forget is this. That in the middle of those gifts that, that you forget that you have one that's far greater. I, I want you to remember this. That's our takeaway for today as we celebrate a classic Christmas this year. I want you to know what God says to you. And it's this, a classic Christmas fill in the blank. To Tim, love God. Or if we just leave the blank empty, you can fill your own in. Because you might get an Xbox and you might get a new pair of socks and, or you might get a new car, but you know what's going to happen to all those things? There's going to come a new generation, the car's going to rust, the socks are going to get holes in them and you're going to throw them away. They're going to, they're going to perish, they're, they're not going to last. They're, they're not gifts that, that have long staying power, but God's gift to you that's given with love from him, your heavenly father, has eternal ramifications. Because whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. <laughs> That's what makes Christmas classic. Because God gave his one and only son so that you and I might have life <laughs> and experience joy around the throne of God for all eternity. So when you're ripping open gifts, when someone comes to you unexpectedly and says, I have a gift for you and your heart flutters, say thank you, celebrate love, but but bring your heart back to the greatest of all gifts that you've ever received. 
the one that was laid in a manger. <laughs> a savior who delivered you from, from danger, from eternity separated from God and, and one for you eternal life because he's the chosen one. He's the Lord and he got the last say in on death and sin and the devil for eternity for you. It's why I love these last words. The Apostle Paul wrote them to a man named Titus. In the New Testament, there are 18 times in the 27 books where the phrase, our Savior, is used. You might think it would be written more, right? Um, 18 times. Uh, the book written to Titus was by the Apostle Paul. He wrote it to a fellow pastor who was uh, someone that he had met one of his missionary journeys and was, was overseeing a church. And, and six of those 18 times where the phrase, our Savior, is is used in the New Testament is found in these three short chapters. Now that sends a message to me. My guess is maybe Titus wondered or doubted uh, and needed to be reassured that the one who came was the chosen one and, and the one who came was for him. Not just for others, but for him and for every last person in his church. Not just for Jewish people, but for, for Gentile people, people who are outside of that family, kind of him. And so in these three verses, the Apostle Paul says to Titus three times, <laughs> he's our Savior, he's mine, and he's yours, and he's ours. And I want that to be the gift that you celebrate this Christmas. Because here's my promise to you, friends. If that's what you celebrate, if that's what you treasure, if that's where your heart is, you will have joy. You'll have joy. That will last beyond December 25th. When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, what transpired in Bethlehem, he saved us, delivered us, not because of righteous things we had done, not because I deserved it, my parents never gave me a gift that I deserved, but God our Father did this because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We know it because of God's gift of grace in the means of grace and baptism, who he poured on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, here it is, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. That gift that God has your name on is not just a gift that we get to celebrate at Christmas, but it is a gift that will be unwrapped and revealed in full on the day that you breathe your last and he calls you home. Because you know not only has he written your name on that gift that was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he also wrote your name in the book of life. And you know I did it. Right behind it in my heart, I believe he said to Tim, love God. And that's what he did for you too. And that's what makes Christmas an everyday classic. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are only a few days away from Christmas. And sometimes we lose our focus in the middle of the gifts the excitement of having our name spoken uh, and ripping open the wrapping paper. But this Christmas, oh Lord, every time we open a gift and we celebrate the love with, it, with, with which it was given, may we remember your gift that has our name on it, each and every one of our names, just like you had the shepherd's name on it, because you so loved the world that you gave your one only son. Lord, when we celebrate that gift and the gift that is ours because of him, that our name is written not just on that gift at Christmas, but the gift of eternal life in the book of life. That'll, that'll be a game changer to make this Christmas more than special. It makes it classic because every day then is a celebration of, of all that that gift means for us as we look forward to every day with you in heaven. Lord, we pray for your blessings as we get closer to our Christmas celebrations. Make them classic, founded on your love for us and the gift of a Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. Amen.